I devour the five lands, and drain the three seas, yet only the sky is impossible to reach. With this body lacking wings, hands, or legs, I am the World Serpent. My name is Jormaga. The life of an arms dealer is hard. What's not with the weapons and killings and collapsing morals? It's all screams gray. You're not doing anything illegal per se, but are you really doing any good at all? Welcome, otakus and casual manga fans. Today we'll be looking at a manga that takes us into the life of one very, very interesting arms dealer. Today, on Volume by Volume Reviews, we review Jormagan, Volume 1. Story Volume 1 of Jormagan begins with arms dealer Coco Hekamatir and her mercenary group recruiting a highly touted child soldier by the name of Jonah. The team is initially offset by this because Jonah is a boy soldier that happens to hate weapons, this making him an unpredictable component to a very stable team. But Coco is the boss and more or less commands them to take Jonah under their wing. The e uneasiness about Jonah is gone though by the end of the first chapter, so it's kind of a failed concept to begin with. The first volume has Coco and the team running about in East Germany taking back containers filled with fighter jets and stopping any supplies of high and decent requests from HCLI, to going head to head with other arms dealers near the Russian border. I certainly like how Takashi Kataru paced this first volume. It was hectic with new characters popping in and out, but it fit nicely into the job description of Coco being an arms dealer. The world that Coco inhabits is one of guns, assassins, and suits. The taste of story and pacing should come as no surprise to some as Katoru has refined his technique by writing the enjoyable ordinary plus minus. Katoru does challenge himself though this time by going over themes such as war on a global scale and admiration. He doesn't get too detailed with these concepts but hey you can't blame a guy for trying to add a little depth to his story can you? Characters the characters of Jormagan are where most of the manga shine in my highly professional opinion. Coco herself is... well, loco. Coco is subtly crazy I should say instead though. Throughout the volume you get a sense of she is much more capable of causing more mayhem than she lets on and seems to control the situation off the battlefield while occasionally getting involved. But she lets her bodyguards obviously do most of the grunt work. To which they happily do, in fact. It's pretty evident in the manga that Coco team trusts her a great deal and goes beyond a mercenary group to more of a tight-knit family. Jonah, the new addition to the group, is a child soldier who hates weapons because they killed his parents, but he uses them to kill others. In fact, mid-story Coco calls him out on this. Also, with Jonah being a child soldier and all, you'd think he'd be experiencing some sort of post-traumatic stress disorder from it, but alas, he seems pretty normal save for the whole not talking much at first. He slowly opens up as it progresses, but not by much. You also see the beginning of a certain relationship between Coco and Jonah, which mirrors a devil enticing a poor soul into the darkness. The fact that Coco's character blankly comes off as some sort of demon is such a great example of presence on her part. Nonetheless, the first volume mainly does serve as Jonah's personal look into the team and the working of Coco herself. Others in the group include Lim, Lutz, Tojo, R, Yugo, Wiley, and Valmet. They unfortunately don't have much development in volume 1, but goddamn they all look so cool doing their thing trying to protect Coco. Valmet actually does get a little bit of development though. You get a snippet of her path through a conversation between her and another mercenary, Milt. She comes later along in the volume. Besides, they all come off as more than capable of their job of protecting Coco, which is I guess the point. The majority of the cast not getting much character development usually would be a big deal, but it's entirely saved by Coco's good graces and presence. She is so interesting, mixing smarts and brightiness and cockiness and guile so gracefully. Kotaru outdid himself with this character. She comes off as an exploitable god. And really, we need more of those in manga today. Art 
Takashi Katsuru has done a great job of illustrating Jerome again. His character illustrations are very, very unique. Katsuru battle scenes are pretty good, too. He delivers a somewhat frantic approach while drawing, emphasizing the craziness of battle. He also doesn't put great detail into the death of the bad guys, but he makes it noticeable nonetheless. His use of shadowing in Volume 1 is good throughout. I would also like to pay special attention to Koka herself, as her character design is wildly different than others in the manga. Her body at times seems free-flowing and more relaxed at times than others, and her smile and eyes are drawn a tad wider, and she herself looks like a bad guy, honestly, like I said earlier. She just seems to emanate evil from her looks alone. For example, from panels like this, and this one, yeah, like I said, it's exciting to say the least. Overall... Overall, I think Takashi Kato has caught on to something with Joram again. The concept is interesting, and its execution of that concept worked for the most part. A fresh new killing team that seems more like a family than a group, and an interesting main character in Coco Hekimatir. My only complaint is the stories themselves are a tiny bit confusing at first, as in, why is what they're doing important? But eventually, Katru finds his groove. The only thing I can really compare Jerome again to is, of course, Black Lagoon, which has been on hiatus for the past two years. However, Black Lagoon clone, it is not. It is an entirely new monster by itself. A monster called Jerome again. Overall, I give this volume one of Jerome again a B.